Hello. So I'm John Spear, and I'm a professor here at the Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado. And welcome to Golden. If you haven't been here before, I call it the hub of the universe. Some people think Boston is the hub of the universe. I think they're lying. I think it's here, right? So this is Golden, and we are we're gathered. <laughs> Correct. We don't have that, right? Um, we're gathered here for retirement symposium for normal pace, and. I was getting, so I was calling it the PACE Symposium and Norm PACE's Retirement Symposium, and then I just started calling it the Normposium, which seems like a fitting title for this, so it's going to be the Normposium. I have a couple of orders of business to get done first. The first thing is, is I'm wearing a bolo tie, and on my bolo tie, there is an Anukshuk, and an Anukshuk was the symbol for the 2010 Vancouver Olympics. It's also the universal symbol of greeting and warmth for the North. So this symbol is used in northern Canada, northern Alaska, northern Russia. It's used around the northern hemisphere. Whenever you find one of these, it's like a stack of rocks. It can serve as a cairn and a guidepost, right? And it's, it's kind of a, a sign that things are good if you pass there, right? And I'll be talking about the north tomorrow, which is another reason why I'm wearing this tonight. But I wear this tonight because Norm's lab throughout its history has been a place of, of many people passing through and a lot of amazing things coming from what has passed through. And, and it's kind of a universal symbol of greeting to have been through his lab and then move on and then make this field what it is. And that's why I, I have this. As a couple of orders of business, um, this is a schedule that I've been passing around in emails. Many of you have gotten more than one email from me uh, uh, or various other things. Um, tonight we're gonna have a keynote from Norm. Tomorrow morning, the first talk will be from Dan Frank at 8.30. There'll be coffee and tea and such. <laughs> exactly. There'll be coffee and tea out here in the atrium prior to Dan's start. And then we'll have a coffee break. We'll have a buffet lunch at 11.30, resume at 1. Another coffee break in the afternoon. We'll try to be done by 4.30-ish is the idea tomorrow. Um, so that's what I have kind of as an order of business. We're going to have a reception after tonight, and it's going to be right behind us. There's an atrium right behind this wall back here, and we'll convene out there for uh, appetizers and beer and wine and such. So that's kind of the plan for the next, uh, this evening and tomorrow. So what I get to do now is do something that I've done several times, and that's introduce Norm. And introducing Norm is, uh, Norm has had an amazing, complex life with lots of paths. I first heard, Nor heard about Norm as a caver. I was caving, and I heard about this story that was spreading around by word of mouth of this guy who was left hanging upside down in a waterfall in a cave in Mexico. And he was like a legend in the caving community. It's like, who is this guy? You know, right? And several years goes by, and I met Scott Dawson my Cobo University course in Woods Hall, Mass. And uh, Scott was from Norm's lab. He was a graduate student in Norm's lab. And Scott uh, sent me a letter. He said, Norm is moving to Colorado. And so I was finishing my PhD, and I joined Norm's lab in 1999. And I got out of there in 2005. I got out. <laughs> uh, and I moved 20 miles down the road to here. Uh, and it was, you know, I always tell people my postdoc in Norm's lab was the best job I've ever had. And I think a lot of people in this room can probably say that with your association with Norm. And that's what we're here to celebrate today and tomorrow. Um, so Norm has been in science uh, for 46 years. He got his undergraduate in Indiana, his graduate degree working um, with Saul Spiegelman at Illinois. Did a postdoc at Illinois after that. Moved over here to the University of Colorado Medical Center, the University of Colorado Denver Med Center, when they were on probably uh, Colorado Boulevard, right, Norm? No. Was there for about 15 years, then moved on to Indiana, was there for about a dozen years, went to Berkeley for three years, came back to Colorado at Boulder 16 years ago. And so he has a lot of years in science. Norm's lab has been divided into different parts and halves. There's the biochemistry, ribozyme, RNA side of the lab, and there's the search side, which we all affectionately call the search. So today and tomorrow, we're going to be talking about a blend of these things uh, over this time that Norm has generated. Uh, coming up on 300 papers, many book chapters, he has received some amazing awards. And I'm kind of surprised that 
The National Speleological Society gave him the Viking Award for exploration, surveying, and mapping. And that was 1987. And to get the Viking Award is a remarkable achievement in the caving world. And the caving world was clearly on to something before the National Academy of Sciences gave him National Academy member in 1991. And then he got a MacArthur Fellow in 2001. He has three large awards that any one of us could ever hope to have. An amazing career, some of which he's going to talk about tonight. Um, to quote a songwriter, uh, I want to say, so Jerry Garcia, for the Grateful Dead. And Jerry, he said that whenever you do anything, whenever you play music or, or, or you know, associate yourself with music, you have to play your notes. And you have to don't rush. You have to play the note and play the music the way it's meant to be played. And the second thing you have to do is you have to give things full value. And I think Norm's been giving things full value for his entire career. And to have not be rushing through life and giving things full value, I think epitomizes Norm, which is why I just said that. So with that, Norm, let's have you start. Interesting over the years wasn't me, it was you guys. You all know that. However, uh, I was led a very fortunate, very fortunate career in science, and it was because I was born at a very interesting time. You know, circumstance and opportunity make all of us whatever we are. This is a Mayan glyph. A friend of mine who's a caver wrote a computer program which gives, casts Mayan glyphs or dates. Now, and it's considered good fortune to have a glyph cast in your, in your name. And uh, if you go down to the Yucatan jungles, for example, you'll see many of these sorts of things. And this is my birthday. Now, the reason it was, I consider it lucky is actually because of what happened on October the 4th, 1957. October the 4th, 1957. Does that ring a bell? I was a newspaper boy then. I recall popping the wires around my newspapers and opening up and seeing a headline that said, Reds launch satellite. Spook. Now that was interesting because this really frightened the US Congress. And they put an enormous amount of money for the time into science education. I was a beneficiary of that. Uh, I had a fairly elaborate laboratory when I was in when I was in high school, and and I'll say a little bit more about that. Let me just trace a little bit of the history of what I'm going to talk about because what I'm really going to talk about mostly is you guys. So uh, I graduated from high school in 1960 with all the federal money flowing into education, one thing that they, the National Science Foundation recently formed did was to create a series of so-called high school science institutes, which were put in place in many universities around the country. And I'm not sure why, how I was selected, but I was selected to go to Indiana University with 64 other high school students from around the state of Indiana. I was from a small farming <coughs> community, graduating high school class of 36 students. At any rate, so I went off to Indiana University between my junior and senior years in high school and was fascinated with the university environment. At that stage of the game, my loose thoughts about career was to go to Purdue and be in our naval ROTC, so they would pay for it, and then I would become a chemical engineer. Well, when I sent it, was posted off to Indiana University for two weeks, there, there was a second cut made to 18 students. And these 18 students were posted off into various laboratories to work. And I was posted off to the laboratory of a guy named Dean Fraser, one of the early page molecular biologists. And this was a time now, 1959, 59, structured DNA was just on the table. No one knew what ribosomes did, all this kind of stuff. And I was fascinated, and I wanted to do molecular biology, and so I went to Indiana University and, and uh, I did undergraduate work working throughout that period. And, 
I went to the University of Illinois and got a PhD. Had an R01 by age 27. And that's not uncommon. It's not uncommon. And then moved to Denver, the National Jewish Hospital in the University of Chicago Medical Center. So I did phage molecular biology up through my graduate work and then moved off to Denver. And then we started accidentally, so explain, uh, worrying about RNA processing, which really wasn't called RNA processing, it wasn't a field at the time. But later we got into it. And then that continued to develop first with a highly resolved system for RNA ribonucleus processing of ribosomal RNAs. RNA-SP came along, the ribozyme, early on, a long time ago now, the search we call it, you know, environmental microbes that do interesting things. Now, just this, this is going to be basically the last of the, of the bio stuff you're going to get out of me. So when I was in high school, my father was an explorer scout master. We had an explorer scout troop, and we were into making rockets. I was into making bombs. We were into making a bomb called a rocket. <laughs> Happily, we never fired the thing out of it. That's been a, I had a good time in college. I was going to label this up here with dork. <laughs> I got into caving during those days and, and uh, remained associated with the area. This is me dropping to the top of the virgin, 118, what turned out to be 118 meter deep pit. Wonderful place. Long scale survey, I did two kilometers in one day. Well, we moved, uh, uh, in my PhD work, I worked in this lab with Saul Spiegel, and, and we worked with an enzyme called Q beta replicase. It's a viral RNA replicase, which is capable of replicating Q beta phage RNA. An interesting thing that we could do was to make infectious RNA. And that we call a lot of press at the time. And these are the kinds of experiments that would be done. This was out of my thesis. We would, we would run polychromite gels and slice them up into lots of, little, lots of little slices and then count radioactivity and so forth and monitor the course of biosynthesis of this. This was the early PMAS paper, the first PMAS paper. Well, at that stage of the game, we were the only people in molecular biology running polychromite gels with RNA. At that stage of the game, the technology was sucrose density gradients for the RNA people. The protein people were running polychromite gels, but there was somehow a theme around it. It didn't work with RNA. It turns out it did work with RNA. You just have to clean up the chromite a bit. This was the paper that first got us into RNA processing. My, my ex, Bernadette, was working with me in the lab, and Roger Peterson was working in the lab. And a guy came through town giving a seminar. He was studying the drug Levorquil, which he claimed was a specific inhibitor of ribosomal RNA synthesis. I don't know how to believe that. And uh, so Bernadette, who was doing hybridization experiments at the time, set out to show that indeed ribosomal RNA was being produced. And during the course of this, we ran our new high-tech, high-resolution polyacrylamide gels. And we could see the newly synthesized 16S ribosomal RNA underwent a maturation to what seemed to be a smaller size. But some folks thought it had a different confirmation and so forth. And also 23S had a precursor. And not only that, 5S RNA had a precursor and transfer RNA had a precursor. So that was the first demo of all stable RNA species for post-transcriptional processes. Again, the field of RNA processing wasn't even meant to get at that stage. I have you Martin Payton again today, sitting right over here. This guy was a postdoc in one of my early postdocs, Ford Doodle, who some of you will know. And Ford did some really clever experiments in the lab, but this guy over here was doing it at the same time in Copenhagen. And this was using the drug rifampicin to and rifampicin inhibits transcription initiation. And so we were wondering whether ribosomal RNA operons were coupled. At that stage of the game, we didn't follow the sequence that wasn't on the table. And so what, what Ford uh, thought up and what Martin Pato thought up completely independently, the experiments somewhat differently, is to inhibit RNA synthesis with rifampicin allow residual RNA synthesis to occur and measure how much of the different ribosomal RNAs were produced. And if the RNA polymerase is reading through a bunch of off or a bunch of ribosomal RNA genes, there would be a whole lot of ribosomal RNA following initiation. If it read only a single gene, it wouldn't make very much RNA. And the bottom line, which is that we could show that the, that the 16S, 23S, and 5S ribosomal RNA genes were coupled with transcription. It was kind of a big deal at the time. This was 
first of nature that appeared in this paper and the Bible's paper. You only published that in Gold Spring Harbor, I think. Yeah. Nice to nice study. We also got into working with eukaryotic molecular biology at the time. This is Tom Walker and uh, Ray Erickson and Bear. And studying a small RNA that occurs in C type tumor viruses, 7S RNA. So we found 7S RNA in the tumor virus working with Ray, and then found it in normal cells. Look, normal cells. There's still 7S RNA in normal cells in a polychromite gel. We continued to study it. Mitch Sogan came to the lab and picked up that as one of his projects and, and studied and showed that what the 7S RNA was associated with polysomes. It was doing that phenotype. What did do? it do? And then Peter Walter came in from the membrane side of things and showed that this 7S RNA and this SRP RNA signal recognition protocol. It remains an interesting question why that RNA molecule is associated with vector viruses. It's an interesting question. Maybe it will be interesting with respect to cellular transport. I've tried to sell this project to several people. Then Mitch came to the lab about that time, but his first game was developing an in vitro uh, RNA synthetic, in vitro RNA processing system for virus ribosomal RNA, and uh, published some simplified papers with it. And other folks here, Martin Pato, who then ultimately ended up in, in Denver, and Charlie Radcliffe, who is also back here in the audience somewhere, uh, read this paper, which was published in 1973, in vitro system. It was a very, very popular system at the time. It remains. Best, the best result of any of the rights of the processing Now, we were also worried about structure by this RNA because we're interested in how enzymes recognize RNA molecules. We're not looking at sequence, we're looking at higher order structure, three dimensional structure. And it, it turned out uh, uh, Carl Woe said by comparing different 5 RNAs, he pulled out a common secondary structure of 5 RNA. We had a lot of data, a bunch of other sequence data that fit into that as well. We knew enough about the structure that we now begin to take the molecule apart, pedal with the sequences and so forth, and stick it back together. There's an early paper where we did that kind of stuff. That was not, there were no T7 transcription systems in those days. This was all isolated RNAs, bust them down into fragments, do various enzymatic and chemical things to add stuff, and so forth. And it's very hard stuff to do. Do it this day and afternoon, but at that time, the cutting edge of the plate acid synthesis. It's kind of bad to my eye. Jordan. Still out. In the early 80s, then, of course, along came RNSP, and this is Kathleen Gardner. Kathleen Gardner is the one who discovered the RNA catalytic activity of ribonucleus PR. Terry Marsh. Terry. Uh, and this set us off into working with RNSP. And other folks were working with RNSP, Sybil, and working with RNSP, and got the prize, of course. But we were really focusing on structure, structure. And, and not many people at that stage of the game in the early 1980s were thinking of RNA structure in a realistic way. The goal was stage G, C's, and U's. You could not see this RNA at that stage of the game with any, with any ease whatsoever. And we set out after the structure, ultimately, of RSP. Uh, Kathleen worked with the RNA, Terry worked with the protein. We thought the protein was going to be the enzyme activity. And so we've been after that RNA structure for a long time. And not just fake structures, real structures. <coughs> the first thing uh, we did was to follow the Carl Wells way, getting RNAs, PRNAs from different organisms, see if thing as best we could, and then comparing them in order to pull out, identify the common structure. This was the first common structure of RNAs, PRNAs to be pulled out. The remarkable thing about RNAs, P is it's highly varied. Of different organisms, you plot the sequence of subtlest RSP versus that of E. coli. You don't see any line of similarity at all. 16 actually easy to pick it up. But we were off, we knew that structure was right. Oh, the point of sequence like variation. It's Claudia Reich in the picture there. Uh, Brian James, Gary Olson, Jin Song Lu, and some other folks up here. I guess that's it for this set. Uh, came up with our first complete structure of. of RSP RNA, a good structure, satisfied by alignments with a whole bunch of different organisms. In retrospect, we could have, we could have gotten that structure a lot sooner if we could do what we could do now, maybe clone the sequence into the 
pull and see what's there, but, but uh, could be the sorts of things you could do now. What we didn't learn about the structure was, and the, the real key was, was comparing different molecules from different organisms, and so we knew about, enough about the structure that we could, get, could begin to ask questions about where's the action. And so this was a, 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 a designed RNA molecule, which is a composite, as it were, of this and this. We designed that structure, you'll recall that here, we designed this thing in a group meeting. And uh, the goal was to plug together the shortest sequence length of both those molecules to get that many mini -peed. Here's Dave Waugh telling us that it works. And we can go even smaller. And here's Rob Siegel telling us the micro P works as well. We really knew the structure pretty well at that time. All the extra stuff is just provided the moments to go Here's a paper that I really like, even though the answer is wrong. <laughs> this, this was the first application of use of environmental sequences to infer RNA structure. So until this time, getting RNA structure by comparative ways, you had to get an RNA molecule. Gene sequence, and then we another one sequence. But by now we had started working with uh, PCR was available. We started working with environmental sequences and using conserved PCR primers to lift things up. And so Jim Brown, uh, who's also here, uh, uh, developed primers for RNAs PRNA and went down to the Jordan Hall greenhouse and isolated some and then got some, some green slime, which had isolated some bulk DNA from and then used PCP primers. RNAs P primers to grow up a whole bunch of RNAs P's, and they could do a sophisticated uh, covariation analysis to identify all the secondary structure of the molecule. One of the things he picked up was a really acute tertiary structure interaction, which turned out not to be right when you got the crystal structure that was still in this paper. I like this guy named Rubio and, and uh, uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth uh, Haas. Elizabeth was in the drawing cartoons. Here was one of the cartoons. You see the RSP in the background? The <laughs> big Santa Clauses and varieties of other things. Another person who was here, Alex Bergen. At that stage of the game, we had structural information. We can now begin to think about how tRNA talks to RSP. And one way that we did that was experiments that Alex started using photofinity cross linking agents. And so for example, if you want to find out where ribonucleus P active site is, you might take some, take some, take some tRNA and you hang a photofinity cross-linking agent on the phosphate group the RNAs P axon, and you find that the RNAs P and cross-link, and boom, you, you cross-link product, which you can now identify by primer extension for those of you who know that, and identify the cross-link sites using three different types of RNAs P. For each of them, there are idiosyncrasies. The commonality is telling the truth. And the commonalities are shown here. We know now from the crystal structure that those cross link sites are brought together to form the active site. Mike Harris began to use cross linking as well to map tertiary structure. So we have RNSP, and we, we discovered that we could make circularly permuted molecules and move the ends of the RNA around, which made it easy to do chemistry on the ends and determine where cross link sites are, and then begin to build up the tertiary structure. Barrels of the UDCs. That was the first inkling that we had of the local tertiary structure of RSP. Really nice experience. Mike Harris now, Kate Smith, and so Jeremy Ahn Chen continued continue that with Mike and Jim Nolan building up and doing more cross linking and building up the structure. Nice cross linking, cross, cross eye stereo, you can see in all the active site of RSP. And Frank, of course, by the time we had enough structure information that we could tap the you know, tRNA onto the RNAs PRNA, we could then do select sorts of experiments. Experiments selecting for active molecules, and so here's Dan pumping around some in vitro selection to convert RNAs P from a magnesium enzyme to a calcium enzyme. I think that's a really good experiment. Then we got the crystal structure. This is Alexi Kasantsev, Niga Kravenko. Alexi worked first with uh, a graduate student. I wouldn't let him start on RNAs PRNA, but I knew that was going to be really hard, so he started with the RNAs protein. And he got a terrific RNAs protein structure. And those of you who was doing something in resolution with the 0.9 angstroms. You can see the holes in the tyrosine. The tyrosine rings, so it's quite remarkable. And Alexi then continued on with the Cadillac with the RNAs itself. Those are RNAs PRNA crystals, and boy, those, that, that's hard work. And structure of those things like that. 
Once we have that kind of structure, we can then begin to think about how the protein and the RNA interact. There's now a ternary structure uh, out there at this stage of the game. This is Andy Buck, this is Andrew Dalby, lurking beneath that mild mannered uh, uh, front of Andrew. Which is and so Andy, can, can, they, they can show you to a variety of things to map the tRNA binding and the protein binding to the, to the RNA structure. And that, you get a pretty good structure. Just some of the other people, I mean, just talking about some publications going past. Drew Smith did an absolutely wonderful study, a mechanistic study of RNA's PRNA. I was going to get to, I've got an old t shirt that many of you will know there have been t shirts put out in the years dealing with various things. There's that cross eye stereo that I mentioned. And I, I meant to get a demo of those around, but I didn't, didn't get together to pick them all out. And it's sitting there now in the faculty at the University of California Davis. This is the last P paper, the last P paper, in, in 2011. This was a study using small angle X ray scattering to study the solution structure of the RNAs PRNA. And uh, crystal structure is not solution structure, and crystal structure doesn't give you any idea of the flexibility of molecules. And so this was a study done with folks in Berkeley, Rob Rambo particularly, John Taylor, and uh, John, uh, John Taylor was in there too, <coughs> Senior Carol Ford. And this is the solution structure, again, using three different RNA molecules to, to, to do the structure. It's really good small angle scatter, small angle x ray scatter, and the x ray course. Be happy. You've never seen an x ray smile. <laughs> Well, that was the end of P. The goal of going through those was to show you some pictures of some of the people that did this stuff, what they looked like then, <laughs> not necessarily what they look like now. As RNSP was launching in the early 1980s, 1981, this is when uh, we also we set out to begin to study naturally occurring microbes without that caveat of cultivation. Now, my, my, my studies of microbial diversity until then, until this stuff, had been completely dependent upon cultures. Cultures. When you get something by microbe, you have to go out of culture. But it was also known at that time, although not by very many people, apparently, that we couldn't culture much of what's out there. I learned that when I was an undergraduate at Indiana University, we trying to find some particular organisms for nature. It's clear we didn't get much of what's out there. We were doing five sRNA structures at the time in the lab because we were interested in getting refining the five sRNA structure using the comparative approach. And in general, if you can get a thermophilic molecule to work with, you're kind ahead of the game because they tend to be more stable than molecules living at lower temperatures. And so we've been sequencing some high temperature five sRNA RNAs, we being Dave Stahl and, and, and particularly. And uh, I recall Gary. Heard this story, certainly. Uh, sitting in my office in autumn of 1981, something like that, reading this book by Tom Brock called Thermophilic Microorganisms and Life at High Temperatures about Yellowstone. And he was describing in this book this place called Octopus Spring in Yellowstone. He described it as 93 degree hot spring. And he described these pink filaments, kilogram quantities of these pink filaments. Well, we wanted to get a whole bunch of five minutes right in some water, okay? So I went running out into the lab with my coffee and frost and say, hey, look at this, guys. Octopus spring, kilogram quantities, 93 degree organisms. Let's take a bucket of phenol of the Yellowstone. <laughs> Gary, I think it was, said, but you're not even going to know what the organism is. And I said, that's OK, we'll sequence me. And we knew then this was, this was a new game for microbiology. Dave Stahl knew some microbiology. His, he was working with RNA cell 5, and that project was kind of finishing up. Dave Lane, he'd been working with another project in RNA processing, he just got scooped. Gary's always interested in doing something interesting. So he set off to begin to develop methods to characterize naturally occurring microbes without culture. That's the beginnings of metagenomics, what we now call metagenomics. It's very early on uh, we started working with, so I'll say a little bit more about this. this was what we imagined was going to happen, this was going to really review article, 
Dave Stahl sketched this cartoon out of a napkin, as I recall, and then you used as a figure. And the goal was, at this time, remember, no databases, no database, no PCR, cloning, just able to do. Now, happily, my lab had been heavily doing nucleic acid chemistry for a long time. And so we could do all the stuff that you needed to do to do the DNA and RNA work. Not very many other microbiology labs could do that. So the way we first imagined, remember, no databases out there. You have to accumulate some sequence somewhere. The Woes had some five S sequences, we had some five S sequences, a few other people did over about probably about 30 or so five S sequences at the time, something like that. Around the world. And so we five S was an interesting focus because there was a little bit of database. At that stage of the game, there were, there were two small Soviet virus and one virus sequences, only two. This also was before. So what we imagined is we'd go out to a mixed naturally occurring population, and there were two approaches that we would develop. One of these was to isolate total RNA and to isolate 5S ribosomal RNAs. We knew that we could isolate 5S ribosomal RNAs from a complex mixture. Know how complex it was going to be. And we knew that we could sequence 5 s ribosome RNA. And so we could take this mixture of 5 s RNAs and we could use high resolution gel duggery to isolate unique 5 s RNAs and then do sequences of those using chemical and enzymatic degradation methods of uh, enzymatic RNAs. And those of you who know that. And this would give us some idea of what the RNA was of these because Gary Olson wrote the first of the biogenetic download. <laughs> The web didn't exist, and we certainly couldn't download by the methods of phylogeny. We had a we had a very powerful computer in the lab of Lang 2200, which Mitchell required. We had an 8K of RAM, wasn't it? Something like that. <laughs> 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 it had a 16K disk, right? There you have it. <laughs> At any rate, we got done. But what we also wanted to work now, we only went for 5S originally because we knew we could isolate that molecule from nature. We couldn't isolate 16S from the mixed population. At all, we separate them. But we, we clone was just on the table, and we recognized that we could also isolate total DNA and make a recombinant library. We were using South Korean libraries, partial South Korean libraries with Lambda, and we were identifying DNA clones, and ribosomal DNA clones. I'll say a little bit more about that. <coughs> they determined sequences, which we were doing using reverse transcriptase as well as conventional at that time, sending by the oxy sequencing. And then, then we, we get some idea. <coughs> what, what, the, what the sequence is, but again, there was no database at the time, and that was a very early thing, was building up some kind of database here. So here were the first studies that we first undertook to study two things, uh, both with some kind of wow factor, and, and one of these was hydrothermal bed symbionts, which we just recently discovered, things like the big tooth worm, drifty, a with two meter long worms, with a big plume head that abstracts hydrogen sulfide carbon dioxide, and oxygen from the surrounding seawater as it's moving around hydrothermal vent areas. Then, then the gases are transported to an inner, probably a whole lot of our lungs, except in this case it's densely colonized by bacteria, so more trophosome tissue. And the bacteria then oxidize the hydrogen sulfide, uh, convert the CO2 into a low molecular organic complex, which, uh, which you then use to feed the worm. The microbiome, these things were just discovered in the late 1970s, the microbiologists were interested in there were many, many, many attempts to culture the Riptia pacuptola symbiont, but they were all unsuccessful. And that was a piece of cake for this kind of technology. Besides, I wanted to get a ride with Alvin. So that worked out. We went, we went and got some uh, got uh, Riptia pacuptola and a couple of event clams, one type called Calipagina magnifica, another one called Solomaya vila. These are the hydrogen sulfide symbioses. So at any rate, we went out and got some, got some worms, isolated some fault 5S RNA. This would be from both the eukaryotic and the quotes prokaryotic type and bacterial type. And we could chop those out and, and label them, isolate fragments and do fingerprints to make sure the sequence was right and use chemical and enzymatic degradations to determine the 5S RNA sequence. Carrier entries on the 5S sequences with the limited database that were available. And the answer was spectacularly boring. I mean, it was an interesting answer in the sense that we knew we were our ways. But, it, but it's a pretty boring answer because the Riptia symbiont turned out to be a gamma proteobacterium, which for those of you who know that will know, know that it means it's a pretty close relative of Escherichia coli. 
more specific, but it's a very specific relative of the thing called thiomicrospira, which is another sulfide oxidizing marine bug. But the interesting thing, we were after fourth domain, fifth domain, fourth domains, fifth domains, et cetera, really big diversities, and we were really disappointed. The other thing that we undertook was this study of octopus spring that I mentioned. Sam Gemmick went up there, it was Carl Woes, who went with us on the very first expedition to Yellowstone. Went up and got some, uh, some octopus spring the, uh, DNA, <coughs> RNA, made the uh, ribosomal, 5S ribosomal RNA, sequenced the major components, fingerprinted, to make sure that it was what we thought, what we thought it was, and sequenced. And this was really exciting because this thing treated out, and Gary treated this out. Uh, the, the octopus spring organisms were no more closely related to any known bacterial small cell human ribosomal RNA sequences than any of the bacterial any other bacterial sequences were to one another. So here we have something, this is really new. So we moving the wrong way, and that continued. Now, again, no database, right? No database. What do you do? We needed 16S sequences. At that stage, getting 16S sequences, getting only two at the time. And old Carl Woes is one of the long and the time catalogs, but they were fragments. We needed to accumulate sequence. And what we had been using was reverse transcriptase uh, to sequence if we could have a primer of some sort that we could use with an RNA molecule. Two sequences, one from E. coli and one from the Silas Megaterium. Carl Woes built the three domains notion of biological organization based not on continuous sequences, but on what are called oligonucleotides. What you get when you take an RNA molecule and whack it with an enzyme and break it down into a whole bunch of fragments. Woes characterized the fragments. And by using the sequences within the fragments, he could relate different RNAs from different organisms and begin to build phylogeny. But we could take those oligonucleotide catalogs and Woes and lay them into the existing sequences and thereby identify them serve sequences in the ribosomal RNAs. Now, uh, we knew enough of that I was basically a chemist. This is a paper where we first reported the occurrence of so-called universally conserved oligonucleotide sequences in sequences, stuff that we now use for PCR, for example. It was Big Lane, and uh, it was me, but we were, I, I synthesized the first, uh, synthesized the first set of universal primers after, after the identified and we being Harry and Robert Hutel and Harry Mahler and Carl Rose and Mitchell and who else was involved in that was in, uh, came up with three good three good universals also now being used and really are being synthesized or synthesized and using phosphate triester uh, dinucleotides and condensing those to get the all this that's the very first effort this is running off of the universal primer. And the universal primers originally were developed in better sequence and then obviously became Useful for PCR as a new plug. Well, a lot of wonderful people moved through the lab during all of the years that we've been doing this kind of stuff. Some of them are present. Uh, I'm not sure if that Maris Erringer came down. She's now a associate, maybe even a full prophet. Uh, CU Boulder now. It's Hazel Barton, just got married. Michael Giesel, some of you will remember Michael and John. Scott's in the audience. Michael Boyd at the dead. Dave Lane's dead, died of ALS a couple of years ago. Paul Rose, Esther Anger, my expert death, and Sean Turner, who will remember some of you, there's Anna Louise, and Sue Barnes back there with a big smile. Well, the, the, in terms of the most general way of going after the natural microbial world, as we began to, the bias, there's not enough information content there to do that. We needed the 16S sequences, but the technology, again, wasn't on the table. <coughs> for using those until cloning came along. This was the very first uh, analysis of a, of a shotgun clone library, in this case from a, from a site north of Hawaii, in the northern Pacific. This, uh, this uh, 1991 was the first shotgun library. Went out to the northern Pacific, uh, Ed and Tom Schmidt, and uh, uh, pumped 8,000 liters of seawater, as I recall, Made DNA, made a lambda, made a lambda caron library, lambda plaques, the individual ribosomal RNA gene containing plaques were identified in two ways by, by mixing, by hybridizing with a mixture of ribosomal RNA from 
bacteria of archaeon and eukarya fragmenting using that as a probe, or alternatively using the 1391 universal primer as a probe to pick out ribosomal RNA genes and then these were sequenced. And, and this is where the first of the marine picoplankton uh, studies came from. Craig Venter's well celebrated Sargasso Sea was uh, 13 years later. Now, so we can now go into the environment and determine what sequences, determine sequences and do what biologically we could. But now we wanted to go from the, envi from the environmental sequences back into the environment to visualize what it is that we're sequencing on. The microbiologists don't want to see sequences, they want to see pictures of microbes. So the goal here was to identify sequences that are specific for groups of organisms or specific organisms Measure cell biology nucleotide hybridization probe, which you can fluorescently label and carry out hybridization on the native sample. These are just various of these now called fluorescence in situ hybridization experiments. This is Ed DeLong, one of our Halloween parties, and Chief Wickham, another character involved here. I'm not going to pick through the detail of these. Phylogenetic stains. Staining technology has a very long history in microbiology. And so the notion that here we're using phylogeny methods to specifically identify organisms using a staining technique of biotonic stains stuff. That's what was suggested by Carl Rose because of the historical relevance to staining. So then we went out and did a bunch of stuff. I this is ripped in the tube room, for example, and a lot of stuff in Yellowstone and elsewhere. This is famous obsidian of uh, optical spring in mine in Northern California. Don't let anybody tell you that eukaryotes don't live in salt brines. This is a salt block, a block of salt. And these colors are supposed to be microbes, but then here's a grout down here, nudging on the, the microorganisms. Also, a lot of nematodes live in there, it turns out. So. <coughs> Esther Anger from the biggest bacteria. I like that. Jeff Walker, Kirk Harris. One of many microbial mats studied over the years. Here's an interesting one a study of Jeff Walker for his thesis a study of crypto endolithic microorganisms. You don't think about it, but every, every sunward rock surface on the planet is cultured to depths of millimeters to centimeters by microorganisms. So if you go up on the flat iron, just a boulder, for example, hack off a piece of rock, that's what it looked like on the surface. But if you cut it up and look at it from the side, you can see green stuff to depths of about a centimeter or so, and if you shine light on it, you can see how transparent the stuff is. So Jeff said these crypto hidden end up inside lithic rock, these crypto endolithic organisms all around the Rocky Mountains. We do work with Scott Suvars and Louise, Jeff. One thing we do kind of neat, uh, there's a wet well in Yellowstone called Well Y7. Temperature up the top is about 55 or 60, and the temperature at 140 feet down is uh, about 120 degrees. So it's, we were looking for life in that well by hanging in, in situ in culture chambers down inside this well. So that's what Jeff is doing, he's hauling the cables to follow up the fish. And Louise, even myself, this was, this was in the mid 1990s, early 1990s. And Guy named Mac Plinsky at Northern Arizona University had recently developed a side scan sonar map of Yellowstone Lake. Side scan sonar, you can see not only, not only topography, but you can also see gas bubbles. So, where we see gas bubbles, you know there's hot water coming out. And so, we look at hot water out in Yellowstone Lake. The hottest thing it comes is about 80C. It's coming up through sand. Yellowstone Lake is not a good place to do hydrothermal band type experiments. It's really muddy. Well, this was a really, uh, of course, as we started doing this stuff, other people started doing it too. And there were a lot of people visited the lab during, this, uh, during that mid-1980s to early 1990s to, to learn about this stuff. And of course, the sequencing really shot up for many, many people. So starting back in here, there was virtually very little sequencing being done, just screaming. And, and uh, I, I, this was compiled. This was, this, uh, this was compiled, I guess, the Dan Frank generated this in about 05. There's another one in 09 as well. But the important point is that huge numbers of sequences have been generated. Now the number of sequences that are available in the databases 
dwarfs the number of sequences that, 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 that have been determined for cultivated organisms. So in 1987, Carl Rose wrote a review article. At that time, he could, this is just a cartoon of the bacterial tree. These lines represent bacterial phylum. Carl Rose could identify 12 phylum in 1987, all with cultured representation. Now we're up to about 100. And we've had only about 30 or so have any cultured representation, and really only seven of them have any significant culture, cultivation, and that's uh, because of the patent that contain pathogens. That, that, that has been a wonderful thing to watch them all. Big tree didn't change. When we first started out with this, I had told them we were going to hit fourth domains and fifth domains and stuff like that and expand, but we, we, that didn't happen. Archaea, bacteria, eukaryotes, that, there are people sometimes claiming there are other, by other, other uh, domains out there, but I don't think we're going to see any more. I think we've seen a whole lot of sequences now that we would see since if we were to see a type of organism, if, if there were a type of organism that jumped out of these three domains, I think we would have seen it. Because if, if it were that significant, I think it would probably be widespread, as the archaea turned out to be. In general, we've been a lot of environmental stuff, in general, I think pretty much any place. Uh, 90 to 99% of what you pick up would be bacteria, 1 to 10% or so would be archaea, and nukes would be usually less than 1%, but of course, be very important. Now, there the, this, this uh, technology of using molecular methods to address the natural microbial world without cultivation obviously has a number of interesting implications in, in, uh, for clinical applications, and Dan Frank and Kirk Harris have been real leaders in that. Labs that Dan's uh, been studying, been studying for this particular paper, human inflammatory bowel diseases, and he's continued to work with that as well as other clinical settings. And Kirk also continues to work with uh, cystic fibrosis. Uh, both, both of them on the faculty at the CU Med Center. There's Mary Andy group as well, and a variety of things were done during the course of those by those, by those people. The last several years from the lab, we've gone away from dealing with weird places like hydrothermal vents and hot springs and stuff like that into a much more mundane world as microbiology is all around us. And the seminars that I would give now would tend to have titles like In Your Face, Microbiology <laughs> so We got started in this through, through, through colleague uh, Mark Hernandez, who's in the civil engineers in the environmental engineering department. At, uh, at CU. And Mark is a real pro at, at studying aerosols. And he was contacted by a Midwestern hospital that had some problems with, with infections in the pool facility, which turned out to be pretty common. It turns out that, that folks who work in indoor pool facilities have a significant uh, probability of developing pulmonary exacerbations of one sort or another. Usually when they leave the facility and go work someplace else, they, it resolves and they get well. But sometimes it doesn't. And uh, in this particular hospital, they had two cases of diagnosed mycobacterium avian pulmonary disease. And, and so Mark was contacted to come to the hospital and figure, figure out where the mycobacteria were and how to, how to, how to fix it. And uh, so Mark, he didn't really know figuring out where the bacteria were, but he knew how to collect collect samples and so forth, and so happily, uh, a postdoc with, with Mark, Lars and Anginet, contacted me, and folks in the lab were interested in this, and so we undertook to study that particular swimming pool, determine where the mycobacteria were coming from, and there's not really much you can do about it, because they're coming in with tap water and growing on the biofilms in the pools. You know, if you're, if you're in a swimming pool, if you run your hand down the side of the pool, it's kind of slick right at the air water, Really kind of wash off with that. We also studied, uh, I've long, long been interested in uh, the stuff that develops on your shower curtain, what we call, what we call soap stuff. You know, everybody has soap stuff in their shower curtains. Well, I always wondered about that, and so I scraped off a little bit of my shower curtain soap scum. And, put it under an epic fluorescent microscope and stain it with some daphne, and that's what it is, it's a biofilm, mostly methylobacteria. That led to a study of microorganisms living inside the shower heads. That was 
an interesting study. And an interesting study in the sense that really alerted me to why he considered to be one of the leading public health concern for bathroom facilities. And this is uh, shower heads, shower head microbiology. This is a plot down here, percent of total clones in a particular microbes in a particular sample. This is a whole bunch of different microbes. And these are these, this is this is abundance ranked in that direction. And look at the top hit, mycobacterium species, top hit with shower heads. And, uh, and if you look at what types of mycobacteria they are, uh, here, here they are in the shower heads, about 30% of the stuff in there is not only mycobacterium avian, by C with resentments, 40% mycobacterium bordone with these pathogenic organisms. If you look at the water coming in, mycobacterium avian, mycobacterium bordone, that's where they're coming from, it's just the water itself. Well, that's interesting. You miss the water, loaded with mycobacteria, Christ, what's out there anyway? Well, I don't, no one knew what was out there in the water, so we went to find out, which I'll say more about. We also got very good, uh, following up with Mark, got very good at collecting aerosols. We studied a whole bunch of different places. Uh, uh, Laura, who's, who's here, Perret Cole, who's here, no newspaper, uh, Perret Cole, who's here, got real good at collecting aerosols and studied aerosols in, in school buildings and lots of places. Uh, this is in a, in a this was a hotel, Perret. Is that right? It was a hotel. It's Perret down here. He's an aerosol collector. There's an aerosol collector in the New York City subway. Now, one of the studies we did was the seven stations in the New York City subways in lower Manhattan. I'll tell you an interesting result here because when you're studying these naturally occurring microbial populations, unusual things pop out. It was sort of an unusual thing here. So we went to the bunch, did a bunch of sampling from the platforms inside. These occupied in platforms, <coughs> isolated aerosols, isolated DNA, sequenced a bunch of sequenced a bunch of uh, 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 a bunch of DNA sequencing, and uh, Chuck Robertson put together a very nice uh, collection, very nice database of different kinds of environments, soils, waters, etc. Thanks to the folks at the NIH, there's a very good skin database all over the body. Now, we didn't see a whole lot of skin, human skin microbiology in the subway. In this room, for example, the bacterial concentrations in here are about a million bacteria per cubic meter. 90% of them would be human skin microbiology. And you can understand that because we're sitting here at 37C. I'm standing here at 37C. We're surrounded by 25 or so centigrade. And so we're all putting up this convective plume of warm air carrying skin microbiology. Now think of that the next time you're sitting in a big auditorium. You have this hotter and hotter up in the top. It's leaving and wears on. You know why. Well, because this, as Chuck was analyzing these data, we could have done that we could identify those. These are pretty clearly human skin microbiota. And so now you can reflect on these various databases to see where, the skin database, to see where that microbiology came from. Here are the two top hitters. One is the occiput. That's the top of the head. That makes sense from convection. But look at this plantar heel. Plantar heel. Bottom of the foot. Can you understand that? Well, if you scratch your head a little bit, you'll realize that when you take a step, your heel comes up and then it forces out a little cup. Plantar foot microbiology. And just imagine all these millions of people right around the New York subway, all these little towns. Municipal drinking water. And this has involved us over the past several years now, I and mean, we still have projects going on that, actually. We continue to. We have had in the lab for many years things called bleeding sores. You guys all know this. A bleeding sore is a paper that just doesn't quite get there. It sits and sits and sits, then eventually gets kicked over. Well, the problem with municipal water is that it's, there's lots of it out there, and every time you look, the microbiology of anything municipal sample is always different. So if you want to get some more global view of it, you have to have a lot of samples. So typically, what, what been doing is in this case uh, took a small RV and so built a small RV and Eric Collins rigged it up as a little laboratory inside and 
He and Kim Ross got in their RV in, in Salida, Colorado, which is the headwaters of the Arkansas River. They drove the more mobile lab down the valley of the Arkansas from Mississippi and turned south and went to New Orleans. And every few hundred miles, they would stop and from two different sites take two different samples of water. And this is done by simply going into, for example, into the library and you're down the basement and you go in the restroom and you turn the water on and, and let it run. And we have a chlorine meter and you measure the chlorine. Until the chlorine stabilizes, then you know you're getting lime water. And you take a couple of liters, of, a couple of liters of sample, and then run back out the, run back out the vehicle and filter them down, freeze out the sample, and bring it back to the lab for, for, uh, for analysis. This is a uh, four by four analysis, and this is abundance ranked, and you'll note the top hit mycobacteria everywhere, almost everywhere. Some places there are many, and there are other things that are not necessarily unpleasant. That's a, and that's survey. Now, uh, when we got to New Orleans, New Orleans water. If you go to New Orleans, be sure to use bottled water. <laughs> uh, New Orleans had, had unusual water. And so we went to find out where the unusual water is came from. And so I uh, had two further expeditions going back with Natalie Hall and Eric Collinger and Kim Ross going back to New Orleans, getting together now with the water folks and getting access to the facility working out where the microbiology is coming from. And the microbiology is coming out of, out of the water purification plant. And, and it, it emerges after the germicidal treatment. This has not yet been published We're right now working on that paper. Well, that's interesting. That's, uh, this, this is the, sort of the central United States. What about up in the further northern east? I don't have a, don't have a slide of that, but uh, Natalie Hall and, and Lee Stanish did a what the hell was it, Natalie? Probably a, Thousand mile circuit. Yeah, it was. Anyway, through West Virginia and Ohio and Kentucky and Pennsylvania, it cut through some, uh, some, some pretty interesting terrain, very different from the sediment plants, uh, for example. Most days are still processed. This, so far, has been the last of the real environmental papers. This was a, a bleeding sore, which was published only finally in uh, 2013, a study of the Guerrero Negro hypersaline microbial mat. Here's a slice of that thing. It's a six centimeter thick tofu-like microbial mat. You can see the laminations. This would be the modern version of the so-called stromatolites of the, of, the, of, the, of the old days. And so John was involved in that. Ruth Lay was involved earlier. Don't ever let anybody tell you that Chuck Robertson can't pipette. <laughs> Chuck Robertson is a very talented scientist. He can pipette. And you would see his electron microscopy tomography. That is nice stuff. At any rate, so the goal was to core down through this thing, slice it up into a whole bunch of slices, kick the piss out of it in sequencing. The compliments of this guy, Bill Hugenbold, who at the time was the director of the Joint Genome Institute. Sequencing facility. And so, so as, uh, as uh, Bill, as, as we were getting ready to put all the sequences, all the, all the DNAs into the sequencing run, Ner Bill would nervously call up when he didn't know when he, was, when he could pull the trigger. He was continuously reminding us that it got very expensive when he pulled the trigger. This is at the Joint Genome Institute where they have huge numbers of, of, of DNA sequences in a variety of sorts. I forget how much sequence we got out of something like. I think 20 or 30,000 full length 16 inch sequences, I think something like that. And then a bunch more of small stuff. Group meetings, or groups over the years, you'll see some of these folks around, some of them looking very much younger than they are. <laughs> Here's Amy Buck down here at one of our bowling parties. <laughs> A lot of people moved through the lab over the past nearly 50 years. Jeez. These are the folks that have been involved in RNA science, not only RNA-SP, not only 5S processing, but also various other RNA science projects. This includes not only primary workers in the lab that published lots of papers, but rotation students and so forth. A lot of people moved through the lab. It's very hard 
these days, just because it's so expensive to do things, you just cannot support a lab of, like it used to be possible to do you know, 15, 20 people, something like that. So these are the folks. And, and search folks, again, not, uh, not everybody was publishing papers, a lot of rotation students and so forth in there, but uh, I'm, I'm just impressed with just how many folks passed through the lab. Special thanks here. Donnie Evans, and Steve Marcus, they scan a huge number of, of, of photographs going back to the beginnings of the lab from which I plucked and selected those there. A very, very special, special thanks to Cheryl Rath for we've been taking care of me and the lab for the last, well, less than 200 years. <laughs> for a long time. And of course to John and Cheryl for pulling off this Thank <laughs> you.